am so happy. Things are going so well in Mar-a-Lago that I want to focus on that, but I want to begin. If you combine the projected winners from Decision Desk and the projected winners from the New York Times, the Republicans are at 220 seats. Seems likely they'll get to 222. They might get to 224. So it's a Republican sweep on Tuesday, which means that the budget and the reconciliation process can begin and a number of laws can be passed pursuant to the reconciliation process. I'll explain that a little bit later in the program. And it means the Congressional Reform Act can be passed to do away with any regulation Team Biden managed to pass in the last six months. A great thing. They got to move fast on the CRAs. They got to move fast on the budget and reconciliation. Now the appointments. Five are known. And then the six is Senator Rubio, which is leaked, but which would be a great appointment, but it's been leaked in the New York Times. Three sources have told the New York Times Senator Rubio will be the Secretary of State, and that would be a fabulous choice. Senator Rubio is a uh, very, very eloquent proponent, proponent of the West. And he can tell you in English, and he can tell you in Spanish. He can speak directly to the dictators of Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua. He can talk to the crazy socialists in Brazil and Peru and Ecuador. He can encourage Malay in Argentina. He can go to NATO. He is a great exponent, if it's true. Now, that's the one I'm not sure about. I am sure about Congressman Waltz is going to be the National Security Advisor. And the Green Beret turned Congressman an extraordinary warrior diplomat. His first book, Warrior Diplomat, is about that. He has served at the National Security Council. He has served in the Department of Defense. And he's been shot at and shot people in Afghanistan and Africa and around the world. I know him well member of the Nixon Seminar. My son has worked for him since uh, the first Trump administration went away, and my son was in that. And now he went right to Congressman Waltz's office, so I'll tell you that going forward. I'm never going to bring it up again, because I'm tired of putting the disclosure out there. I've said it like a thousand times. Whether or not that was the case, Michael Waltz is a great, great choice. And my hat is off to Donald Trump for recognizing what he needs uh, in that job, which is a wearying, frantic, extraordinary job, which is someone who's absolutely loyal, absolutely reliable, absolutely leak-proof, not interested in incurring favor with the press. Now, we already knew that the chief of staff was Susie Wiles. I do not know Ms. Wiles. I've spoken to her once. Everybody I know says she's terrific. I also know that Stephen Miller is going back. I've spoken once with Stephen Miller. I think he's an excellent choice for domestic policy. Uh, it used to be what Roger Porter did in the Reagan White House. And the deliverable that Donald Trump must get is a secure border and the deportation of criminals and other people who deserve to go. It is possible to be a border hawk and an immigration regularization dove. That's what I am. I'll write about it next week. Stephen Miller is a border hawk to end all border hawks, and I'm glad about it. When he talks about the cartels, he talks passionately about the abuse of children. And you need to think about that. This is not about shutting the door to your poor, your halt, your blind, your lame. It's about stopping the cartels from raping young women and turning young children into sex slaves in the United States. It's about keeping criminals out of our country. It's about getting the terrorists on the terrorist watch list rounded up. It's about finding the 50,000 Chinese military age male who came in in the last year. It's about getting the wall built. I've been calling for the wall since 2004. And maybe a fence behind it and a fence behind that and tunnel detecting technology and a vastly improved and expanded border patrol because borders matter to national security. Michael Waltz and, if it's true, Marco Rubio and whoever is the sec def can work on the rebuild for peace through strength. But Donald Trump is off to a terrific start. Lee Zeldin, the very able former congressman from New York, who ran for governor and almost won, will know how to run the Environmental Protection Agency. I know the EPA pretty well, knew Scott Pruitt, knew Andrew Wheeler, both good men, did great things. It is an agency that needs to be dismantled in motion and combined with some other agency. They are killing growth in the United States. They do not have the writ that they think they do. They are run by bureaucrats unless a strong hand is at the top. I'm quite, I don't know Congressman Zeldin at all. These are not like my buddies are getting. I know Waltz, and that's about it. I've, no, Senator Rubio has been a guest a thousand times. Uh, ditto Congressman Waltz. Not Lee Zeldin, 
not Stephen Miller, not Susie Wiles. I'm just here to tell you the last one, Elise Stefanik, is as exciting as the first five. Congresswoman Stefanik, 40 years old, is a wonderfully competent and eloquent spokesperson for the West, as is Congressman Waltz, as is Senator Rubio. When I say spokesperson for the West, that doesn't mean foreign adventures. It means standing up for the ongoing expansion of liberty and literacy around the world. It means taking care of our allies and punishing our friends. It means making sure that American troops are not in harm's way, and if you harm an American troop, you'll pay a price. It means you take our hostages, you will pay a price. It means don't start wars. Do not start them. We will help end them if you start them. And if you are violating the law of war, if you're Assad or anybody, Donald Trump is not your friend. That's why Assad got battered, if you recall. Obama gave it away, the red line. Donald Trump restored it. Joe Biden gave it away again in the appeasement of the past four years, and Donald Trump will restore it. He's already restoring it. Did you notice the hoodies declared a ceasefire after Donald Trump won? Suddenly, our sailors are not under rocket bombardment every day. The word is, reports are, both in Israel and the United States, that the president-elect has talked to Prime Minister Netanyahu three times. That's very good. Our allies know we have their back again. We're not going to be cutting off weapons to Israel. I'm sure he's also saying, BB, get it done, because that's what he has told me three times on this show. He needs to win fast. And by winning fast, he has won in, uh, uh, in Gaza. Hamas is, is a, a shadow, piecemeal, cracked mirror. But that still means a couple of thousand of terrorists with guns who can kill civilians and IDF soldiers. The, the conclusion of that operation, the withdrawal of Israel, is at least a year away. And the United States will have to lead in the reconstruction with our Sunni Gulf Arabs in the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and to the extent that they're involved at all, Qatar. Qatar has told Hamas, get out. Good for Qatar. It is time for Hamas to become refugees from the civilized world, and we did for years when it was apparent that we're going to give Hamas the opportunity to turn into a civilized if Islamist state. And they are not. They're, they're barbarians. The Iranians are barbarians. And maximum pressure will be back, I hope. Brian Hook is leading the transition team at the State Department, and that, Brian Hook, is an Iran hawk. And that doesn't mean going to war with them. It means cutting off their oil. It means snapback sanctions. And when crazy stuff is said at the United Nations, Elise Stefanik is going to stand up in the tradition of Gene Kirkpatrick and Daniel Patrick Moynihan and speak for the West. The United States, of course, but for the West, for the idea of freedom, the idea of liberty, the idea of ongoing liberty and, and literacy expansions everywhere across the world, taking care of our allies and frightening our foes. Donald Trump's 2.0 transition is very different. And he's not going to get ambushed again. He was far too trusting of Comey, Brennan, and Clapper. They ambushed him at Trump Tower. The permanent government is not going to get anywhere near President Trump in his second administration. I cannot wait for the attorney general position. Yesterday, Josh Gerstein of Politico said, oh my gosh, they're shuddering at DOJ. We know what this is going to be like. This is the resistance. And you know what? Leave now or be fired. Quit get out or be fired, because Schedule A attorneys, all of them, every attorney at the Department of Justice is a Schedule A attorney. They can be moved. They can be fired. Anybody says anything out of line if you are not at all with Donald Trump. Just leave now. I worked at Justice in 1984 and 1985 for Attorney General William French Smith and Attorney General Edmund Meese. Not for long for Meese. And I did the Foreign Counterintelligence special assistant portfolio, and serious people are welcome. There are great career lawyers at Justice, but it's been politicized, and all of them have to be fired or moved. I mean, you can move a DOJ lawyer anywhere. You can send them to Kansas, and nothing wrong with Kansas. You can send them to Alaska, nothing wrong with Alaska. You can send them everywhere, but make a list, check it twice, transition team, and move land like you're landing at Normandy at Justice, because that's the beating heart of the resistance. And whoever, if it is Marco Rubio, go in there with a blowtorch and take him out. Because that's like a deep blue state. 
like taking over a Republican, taking over governor of California or New York. So put on your your walking boots and your lead toed boots and get over there and start kicking. It's time for Donald Trump to actually bring peace through strength back to the United States. Good morning to you. I have a brand new Fox News column over at Fox News Opinion. Uh, It's 10 lessons from the landslide. And those lessons are many and varied. I encourage you to read it. A couple of them are about the media, the legacy media, which is in ruins. And I bring it up because yesterday I was on with Martha McCollum. And the first question was about a 60 minutes interview having to do with Tom Home and the new borders are, how tough he is on the border and how it's going to be awful and and how terrible Team Trump is going to be for having a border. And Martha asked me about the question. Here is my exchange with Martha McCollum from yesterday on Fox News, the story. Okay, uh, Hugh Hewitt, let's start with you. I would just note, we looked up what the cost of having all of these new immigrants, um, you know, travel to cities, put up um, and given money in all of these cities. That's $150 billion in 2023. Um, So there's a severe cost to that, too. What do you make of these suggestions that the abuelas and other family members are going to be ripped out of their homes, Hugh? I do not know what the cost of a uh, murder victim is. I do not know what the cost of another terrorist attack is. But I thought the framing of that by 60 Minutes revealed the brokenness of legacy media Mm -hmm. and why I hope that in the second Trump term they are cut off completely and nobody talks to them because they can't give up the narrative in air quotes. No matter how trashed it got on Tuesday last, they will not give it up. Everything is framed as though Republicans are criminals or something. Homan is what I look for, competent and eloquent. All four of the appointments that have been made thus far, Ms. Wiles, uh, Congresswoman Stefanik, Stephen Miller, competent and eloquent. Mr. Homan is as well. Very happy with the start, and I don't think the media can in any way downgrade it. And I I just don't talk to him. The 60 minutes framing, Mr. Homan, it'll cost $88 billion to do deportation. And they don't know how much it's going to cost. That's made up. That's some expert who doesn't want deportation. There are 1.2 million deportation orders in the United States in place. These are people who need to be removed. And I would cut off funding to sanctuary cities that do not cooperate with ICE, and I would de- escort the deportee. Now, I am an immigration regularization dub uh, for the Dreamers, for people who are here and are working and been here for a long period of time and can establish their, uh, their good graces, who have not been in trouble with the law for any kind of violent crime felony. They, could, they ought to be able to stay. We need people. And Donald Trump is, I think, uh, immigration regularization dove. He's talking about green cards for college graduates. We'll see what happens. But deporting criminals, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. Let me talk to you a little bit about something else I'm all for. I'm all for stopping um, Big Pharma from delinking uh, the pharmacy benefit managers from their customers. I don't want big pharma. They're putting in a full court press to get more money into big pharma's hand. They are trying to push it in the lame duck session. Nothing should move in the lame duck session that the Republicans can possibly stop from moving. And I'm looking at them for the uh, URL because it didn't print off. So I've got to find the URL for this today. But the, um, here it is, I found it. The conservatives for lower health care costs are running pharmawindfall.com. And we need to stop everything that is attempted to be done to add to the bottom line of big pharma, including delinking the pharmacy benefit managers from you. It's a big pharma money grab from American seniors and taxpayers. And the website to learn about it is pharmawindfall.com. Pharmawindfall.com. Don't get taken again. Big Pharma screwed us in Obamacare. Do not get taken again. PharmaWindfall.com. I'll keep you posted on any breaking news. I do want you to read my Morning Glory column at Fox News, 10 Lessons from the Landslide. And it doesn't count the obvious one. The uh, President-elect Trump's victory is the greatest political comeback story in American history. And I say that fully aware that until this time, my old boss, my second boss, Richard Nixon, was the greatest political comeback in American history. But this is bigger, because nobody shot Nixon in the head, and nobody impeached Nixon twice, and nobody prosecuted him across five jurisdictions wrongfully. 
So that's the biggest takeaway. These are 10 additional takeaways. And if you want to find it, it's at X. On Friday last, after the election, I did my Hillsdale Dialogue with Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. We barely covered a half of what we wanted to. So I kept him around and we continued talking. I'm going to spool out that today and tomorrow. Here is the second half or part one of the second half of my conversation with Dr. Larry Arn, all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Dr. Arn, I have not spoken to you and nor do I intend to talk at length about this, but I quit the Washington Post uh, two weeks ago, I guess now, and I'm done with with legacy media. I have tried for decades to try and make it fair, but I'm done with it, and I'm not going to spend any more time on it. I would like, I'd like what your assessment of what the media was doing. Mary Catherine Ham said they were gaslighting us for a month about the Puerto Rico joke, about Donald Trump being a dictator, about fascism. They were gaslighting us. And I do you think it can be saved? I, I'm done trying. I'm I'm into alternative media now. I do my show, I do the Hillsdale Dialogues, I post and I direct people to podcasts. But what about the legacy media? Do you think it can be rehabilitated? Uh, well, first of all, it's not my habit, as our listeners know, to praise you, but you did a great thing there. You got up. And no, no, out. no. no. <laughs> I, I really, I'm not no. looking for compliments. You never do, no, but no, thank I, you. But I, I'm, I, I'm telling you, I said uh, that, that Hugh, he's meaner than hell. Uh, that was very good, and uh, and you flummoxed him when you did it too. Thank good for good for you. Little indignation goes a long way. Well, well placed. Uh, yeah, the point is, if you saw uh, the weeping and gnashing of teeth as the results became clear, if you saw the horror on the face of some of the major broadcasters, uh, there was no coolness. There was no dispassionate, let's understand what's happening here. There was in some of them, but in many of them, it was just open grief. And Lord, they'd been calling the guy Hitler all week long. And uh, not all week long, years long now. But remember, years. they also called, they, they called George W. Bush that frequently. And, uh, uh, you know, he's a, he's a killer, uh, and, and Bush lied. People uh, died. I hated that. Yeah. Bush never yeah. lied. He was mistaken, but he did not lie. Yeah. And was but, he but really, Dr. I mean, he, yeah, you think, we, we go into all that. Yeah. So yeah, the point let, is, let, let me, let me crystallize the question. Do they believe their own theater or is it theater? Because I am now genuinely confused. I think their grief was real, which would suggest they really believe that Trump is a, a threat to their freedom. And I or I just can't believe they believe that. That would reveal a level of ignorance so astonishing as to startle even me. Some of the writers, uh, especially, are obviously highly intelligent people. And... Uh, yeah. And to get where they are, they, they have to have lots of virtues, of character, and resilience, that word we've been using. Uh, and so what I believe is they are persuaded of something. And, uh, and that justifies them working to change the society. They're on a side, and they don't have that habit of, uh, you know, I mean, you and I both have the experience of hostile articles written about us by important yes. people. And, uh, and I have, uh, to the best of them, whom I won't name right now, I said one time, you know, you're bound to criticize us because we don't have enough black people. And also because we don't know how many we have. We actually have quite a few, but I don't know how many don't believe in that. I said, if, if, if you're going to criticize me for that, and if you're what you say you are, which is attempting to be honest, you should make my argument and then refute it or get somebody to quote to refute it. But my argument is simply, if the human being is capable of rational thought, he must have an immaterial soul. That's an argument from Aristotle. And things that don't have matter don't have color. And so to think that that, isn't, that is important in learning 
If I did that, I would give up the central argument as a first step, and I will never do it. And I said, the test of your article will be, do you put that argument in there? And she didn't. And uh, I know, see, I know. They always fail. They always fail the test. And that, that leads me to my next question. We are going to turn a page, and you referred to this on Friday with the election of Senator Vance as uh, vice president elect. Uh, Donald Trump will finish his term, and then a new generation of leadership. And I don't know that J.D. Vance will be the nominee of the Republican Party in 2028, and you don't know, and there are many fine people in the party, but I know one thing. The generation has changed. Donald Trump is the last of, he wasn't even a boomer. He's, he's old enough to be like Biden pre-boom, but the boomers are gone now. And they will, not, not physically, but they will pass from the, the halls of power. You have been spending 20 years educating a generation of people who I hope walk to Washington in this administration and do great things. Do you think they will? Well, I, I think that we're in, you know, one of the great dramas of the American Republic, and it has just, because of the election, intensified yet again. And so we're going to have the argument now. And I think, I, I said last time that Vance is important, and the reason is he's very articulate and good at making fundamental arguments. And I think he's going to make these. And, uh, and so good on him. And the point is, what you can assure in politics, if you're brave and far-seeing and eloquent and live your life right, as the best statesmen are, and they're few, you can present the choice in clear terms. It's for the people to figure it out. And uh, that's why you were so indignant with the Washington Post when you stalked out on them. Uh, because there, you said gaslighting, and that's what that word means is... Uh, uh, what does it mean? It means not telling them. Uh, and, uh, to confuse reality uh, with your fiction and not to present facts and to make other people think what are not facts are facts by turning up the gas and making them lightheaded. That's it. And they, and they uh, there's a great movie about that. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, that's, that, that, I think that they think that they are doing their duty, but that has changed the definition of journalism. See, uh, and I, I should like, make a note here because I, I don't want to talk about the post because I never talk about my old colleague. But Ruth Marcus is a friend of mine, and she's an old school liberal who went to Harvard Law School, who has really great journalistic chops. And she was caught unawares by that exchange. She had no part of it. I don't want her to be hit by the shrapnel. We have no problem with old school liberals, and uh, my best friends are Democrats and and old school liberals. I have a I have a problem with the media and where it is right now, and I just I just don't know that it can be saved. I also am encouraged. For twenty years, you've been piloting this institution. I just want to know if they're willing to to go and serve, and it's not going to be easy. The left isn't going to go away. A lot of it is secular, and it's all that they've got. In the meantime, we've got Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, Putin, Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, lots of spies, lots of terrorists. We got problems. Um, yeah. We we need leadership. Do we have enough young point. leaders to to do that? I think uh, uh, I'm uh, watching in excitement for the moves of Elon Musk if he makes them, because. Uh -huh. uh, he seems to really know how to run a railroad so well that he's going to run the dang thing to Mars. And uh, he, uh, I know him a little bit and uh, think he's a complete force of nature. Uh, I walked around the uh, Tesla plant with him. My wife and I did. And one of, oh, one I of his that. a guy named Sam. And uh, Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Stop. We, we got to pause and set this up. Tell us. Tell us when you took a tour. I mean, what year did you walk around a Tesla? I've never heard this. I've known you forever. When did this happen? Uh, it happened in 2017. Uh, in oh, January. my goodness. I, uh, I went to the White House to see Mike Pence, who's a buddy of mine. And uh, uh, the fine man who got put in a bad spot. Um, 
he uh, he he. I, I went I went in there. I hadn't been in the White House for eight years. Wonder why. Pause. And, let's uh, pause this because I want to uh, next hour begin with the Elon Musk story. Again, I taped this on Friday with Dr. Arn. It's already over at my YouTube channel in its entirety. And we're going to play it over today and tomorrow because we, we spent another 40 minutes talking about the election and taped it and include the Elon Musk story. And I, I don't want to break that up. Joined by David M. Drucker on X. He is with the Dispatch. Good morning, David. Have you gotten home from Mar-a-Lago yet? I've been home. So it's it's been good to be home. <laughs> Thanks, you. Well, tell me your reactions to uh, Tuesday night. Just hold forth. Well, you know, I, I said going in that I couldn't figure out what was going to happen. I didn't have a gut feel, but that nothing would surprise me. And the, the, the outcome of the election did not surprise me. And look, we're going to sift through all of the data, the exit polling. I'm looking forward to the Pew Research uh, deep dive, which often makes a lot of this stuff even more accurate. Uh, but I think, you know, at, at its basic level, when people are dealing with high inflation, meaning high costs for things they need to eat and survive, and when they feel unsafe or that the world is too volatile and chaotic for them to feel safe. And here I'm just talking about grocery prices. And even though inflation has cooled significantly, and is almost back to normal, costs have not yet caught up and it's going to take them some time to do so. That's what economists have explained to me. And also, you know, when you're talking about a chaotic uh, southern border and people feel like things overseas are not under our control, but we're at the whim of what's happening. These are just basic things and people are usually in that case going to vote out the incumbent party. Uh, and that's one of the things that they did. There are many more threads to this story here, but at a basic level, um, it's very hard to win when people decide that you are not making it easy for them to live at a very basic level. No comment needed, David, but I've been telling people for four years in 2020, the ABC Washington Post poll the week of the election said Joe Biden would win Wisconsin by 17 points and he won by 0.6. This weekend, Selzer's Iowa poll said Kamala Harris was going to win Iowa by three. I think she lost by 11. Uh, those are my two examples forever. I just, I don't want to hear from pollsters anymore. They don't know how to do it. At least they don't know how Wait, to do Trump's way, you, election. By the way, I would say that, that the polling on balance really wasn't that problematic when you look at the margin of error. I mean, the Iowa poll was a big fail. And there were some other outliers out there. But the polling fell within the margin of error, which is why I said nothing would surprise me. And a lot of the private polling um, was a lot more accurate than the public polling. But when you look at the polling, it should have led you to believe that what happened last Tuesday was was very possible. So that it, well, I don't know, blame you for this, David, that, but I, I, all of legacy media it. jumped on board the Ann Selzer bowl and made a, a narrative out of it. And the narrative is dead. What I want to know now, have you been able to confirm Senator Rubio as secretary of state? The only thing I've well, seen is that it's based on a New York Times report from good reporters based on three sources. Have you confirmed it? I haven't confirmed it myself, but I've seen it enough. You know, I've seen it out there enough without pushback from the transition team that. It, it strikes us as accurate. And I know that Waltz is accurate. And I know that Zeldin is accurate. And I know Elise Stefanik is accurate. What do you make of the early appointee? Of course, Susan, uh, Susie Wiles and Stephen Miller are not surprises. They're both competent and eloquent, and I, as are the other four. What do you make of the six selections thus far, including Rubio? Look, uh, Wiles will be a good, tr uh, Wiles is a, a great pick because she knows how to, manage Trump as best that he can be managed. I don't mean influenced, I mean managed. Because a, a chief of staff has to direct traffic in and out of the Oval and make sure the president uh, sees and talks, sees what he needs to see and talks to who he needs to talk to. And look, I think the one thing to remember about Donald Trump is that he, he keeps a wide array of voices around him via his telephone. All right. So I, I don't think this is just a matter. This is not true with with every politician, but with him in particular, 
he's constantly on the phone talking to uh, people not in his cabinet. So there are a lot of informal kitchen cabinet advisors and just other people that he talks to. And so when looking at his picks for these key positions, they do matter, but they don't matter as much as they might in any other administration. And I think with the Walls and Rubio picks, if you want to just examine foreign policy for a second, they, you know, they, in theory, and you know, as I've covered Rubio in particular for for several years, come from the the Reagan wing of of Republican uh, Party foreign policy. Trump does not, and so these are not picks that really buttress his instincts and approach. Um, and at the same time, we know that Trump is going to be spending a lot of time talking to his new vice president, which is different than the old vice president, not just the people, but their view on foreign policy and domestic policy. And J.D. Vance, much different than Mike Pence. He's going to spend a lot of time talking to, talking to Tucker Carlson, theoretically Elon Musk. Donald Trump Jr., I think, is the family member with the most influence versus the first administration with Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner. And so I don't think that any pick necessarily means a policy uh, prescription. I just think it means that these are people that he trusts, that he thinks will do a good job. And Hugh, I've just always been of the school anyway, that uh, personnel isn't as much policy as people think because the president ultimately decides. When this program began 25 years ago on the Salem Radio Network, I had David Dreyer in once a week. And when David Dreyer retired, we named it the David Dreyer Honorary Chair in Congressional Studies. Congressman John Campbell took over, anointed by David Dreyer. John Campbell retired. He anointed Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo retired. No, he anointed Tom Cotton. John Campbell anointed Tom Cotton. Tom Cotton anointed Mike Pompeo. When Mike Pompeo went to state, he anointed Representative Mike Gallagher. When Representative Gallagher retired to go to the Hudson Institute, he anointed Representative Mike Waltz. And now Mike Waltz is going to the White House, the National Security Advisor, so I don't know who Mike's going to nominate, but I got the previous holder of the dryer chair, Mike Gallagher, back. Congressman, good to see you again. I think I'm now running Siege Perilous here, if anyone knows their Arthurian legends. And by the way, the Cavs are 12-0. and 0. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning, Hugh. I think what's clearly happened here is what is referred to in industry and on Wall Street as the Gallagher bump. Um, I, I tend to have the Midas touch. And when I bestowed this chair benevolently on Mike Waltz, he went from being a largely unknown congressman to national security advisor. Um, so really, he's standing on the shoulders of giants. I just would like to point that out. Uh, the giants, in this case, being you and me. So the future of national security is determined on this particular hour of the Hugh Hewitt show. That is the lesson. And, and, and we're going to do more of that by talking about the Department of Defense. Now, I don't know if Senator Rubio is going to be the Secretary of State or not. It's, it's leaked in the New York Times so it's, uh, and widely repeated. But there's no DOD yet. And I know you're writing about this for the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. Can you give me a little peek about what you think? Not a name, but maybe a skill set for DOD, Congressman Gallagher? Well, I'll do both. And I think if you read uh, Gates's memoirs, if you read John Lehman's memoirs of the 600 ship Navy, if you go all the way back to Eisenhower and Secretary Wilson, from which period the term bang for a buck emerges, and that was sort of the essence of the Eisenhower new look strategy. How do we get more bang for a buck by relying on nuclear weapons, our first offset, as it were? What emerges from that is, is the lesson that unless the Secretary of Defense backed by the president, prioritizes change, change will not happen, and the bureaucracy will win. In some sense, to put a more colorful point on it, the next Secretary of Defense has to launch a war, not with China, not with Iran, but with the Pentagon bureaucracy and be ruthless in his prioritization. I think the obvious task for the Secretary of Defense to focus on with a talented Secretary of the Navy is rebuilding the Navy and fixing our shipbuilding industrial base. It is a massive problem. It's going to require the time and attention every single day of the Secretary of Defense armed with a talented team in order to grow the size of the fleet, in order to deter a war with Xi Jinping. Beyond that, there's some creative things the Secretary of Defense can do to start thinking like an insurgent in the Indo-Pacific if you want to get more bang for the buck rather than counting on a massive infusion of new resources. 
take all the money that the Pentagon wastes at the end of every year, upwards of $15 billion, and plow it into multi-year appropriations for critical munitions, the long-range precision fires that can sink Chinese ships. We want the Secretary of Defense to be signaling every single day to Xi Jinping that if he is stupid enough to try and invade Taiwan, we will put the entire PLA Navy on the bottom of the Taiwan Strait. Now, the good news is, among those being rumored, there's some incredibly talented people. As you and I know well, another beneficiary of the Hewitt Gallagher bump, Robert O'Brien, whose, whose ascendancy to National Security Advisor started on your show when him and I co-authored an article together before I was a member of Congress. It would be great for America if Robert O'Brien could serve. Senator Joni Ernst, Army veteran, sees the threats to America clearly. John Ratcliffe, rumors that he might go to CIA, all but could go to DOD. Incredible guy, knows the intel world very well. So there are some great names being floated out there. They need the backing of the president to make some transformative change and restore our deterrent within the next two years, not four years, two years. 2027 is the year Xi Jinping has set a date for invading Taiwan. The next SecDef needs to move heaven and earth to bend the bureaucracy to his will and fire anybody that gets in his or her way. Now, I'm glad we've got China Hawks and Marco Rubio and Mike Waltz. But for defense, I'm talking about S4C. S ships, submarines, satellites, supersonic missiles, and, and cyber. Is that it in a, in a nutshell? I mean, I know we need AI. I know we need all these advanced acquisition methodology, but we need ships and submarines and satellites and supersonic and cyber because they're asymmetrical weapons, and we need a lot of them. Yeah, and when it comes to ships, you know, we do a variety of things. Obviously, we need to re rebuild our surface Navy, but submarines are, are really at the top of my mind right now, uh, not just because they remain our asymmetric advantage uh, relative to China, but also because one of the few good things that the Biden administration did in the realm of defense was the AUKUS agreement. This is the pact we struck with the Brits and the Aussies, whereby we provide the Aussies our sensitive nuclear submarine technology. Great idea. The only problem is AUKUS is dying a slow death because we can't build enough subs. We have an anemic 1.2 hulls a year that we're building. We need to get to 2.5. So I would really prioritize undersea. That, that extends beyond submarines to include autonomous systems. One thing I think the Navy needs is a sort of rapid capabilities office, like some of the other departments have to really focus on unmanned underwater vehicles, the large variety, aerial combat vehicles. You can talk to Jerry Hendricks about that, one of our foremost Navy nerds, who should also, by the way, be part of the Navy team for the new administration, uh, as well as uh, medium and large unmanned surface vessels. So I would put those at the top of the list. I would also add an M to your acronym. Not that the Pentagon needs another acronym, Hugh, but money. We need money, right? My hope is that Congress will provide a robust budget. We'll get out of this continuing resolution cycle, the stop-start budgeting, which lights, puts money in a trash can and lights it on fire. But failing that, the next Secretary of Defense is going to have to get really creative, potentially reducing the size of the civilian bureaucracy, taking advantage of the appropriated but unspent funds that I referenced earlier, or doing something like merely insisting on the law. The law embeds a preference for commercial items over government items. This is particularly important when it comes to software, where the private sector is just light years ahead of the Defense Department. It's meant to prevent the Pentagon from trying to buy everything or build everything itself when there's a commercial item it can buy off the shelf. This law goes violated every single day. And just look at what happened with SpaceX. NASA predicted it would take $4 billion to build the Falcon 9 rocket. Musk did it for $400 million, relying on commercial procedures and processes. It stands to reason that if we spread that thinking throughout the Department of Defense, you could save tens of billions of dollars merely by complying with the law. Congressman, I want to end, and it's good to see you again. It really is. And you have mentioned the bucks and the fact that the Cavs are 12 and 0. I want to, I want to end on the fact that counterespionage has got to be a priority of justice the FBI, and the Department of Defense. 50,000 military-age male Chinese came over the border in the last two years. The Iranians are trying to kill a bunch of our mutual friends. What about counter espionage? Who would you like? Uh, Director Ray has announced he's going to resign. And they need, a, they need someone who knows counter espionage at the Bureau. What, what kind of emphasis should the Bureau be putting on counter espionage? 
Well, you have to assume everything is penetrated. We have public reports about our telecom networks being penetrated, our critical infrastructure being penetrated. So I really think you need two people uh, in the intelligence community broadly. You need people that understand the domestic source of this threat. This is sort of the biggest theme that emerged from my work as chair of the Select Committee on China, which is that this is not just an over there problem. China has penetrated our infrastructure, our universities. They use nonprofits in order to set up illegal police stations on U.S. soil. You need an FBI director who understands that, a CIA director who has a talented counterintelligence team. But you also need very talented cyber professionals. And there I would look to the folks that staff our select committee on China, which range from people like Chris Inglis, uh, who was phenomenal um, in, the, in the cyber community, um, as well as uh, Tom Fanning, who is the CEO of Southern Company, a rare private sector CEO who understands the importance of cyber and I think could make a great pick at energy or in a cyber role. So pair those two things together with a talented leader at CIA like Ratcliffe or O'Brien, and then you're cooking with gas. And I got to say, thus far, Trump has, has hit all of his picks out of the park. So I, I, I hope he continues this trend. I want to go and listen. What Which of these wonderful cuts should I use? Should I use Ken Dillian, David Axelrod? You, you mean, or, or, or as his friends call him, Ken Delanian? That, that Ken Delanian, that's it. Let's, let's do this. Cut number nine. So the tension you described that the New York Times reported on in, within the transition team was described to us as a battle between the normies and the crazies, although, of course, the people we're talking about would disagree with that characterization. We focused on a couple of lawyers. One is one's named Mike Davis. He's a very conservative, kind of a bomb throwing stop right provocateur. Here. Who used Let's stop right here. Ken Delanian. Delanian, am I right? Yes. I've known Ken in, in, a, in a hello, how are you? I don't know him well. He has no sources inside of Team Trump. None. No. Zero. No. There is nobody at MSNBC that knows anything that's going on inside Team Trump. I just wanted to make that point. And on Friday, Dr. Larry Arn joined me for the Hillsdale Dialogue, and he stayed longer because we were covering the election and the aftermath. And I said, I'm going to play it all on today. And let's go back to the tape where he discovers, where I discover that he knows Elon Musk. Tell us. Tell us when you took a tour. I mean, what year did you walk around a Tesla? I've never heard this. I've known you forever. When did this happen? Uh, it happened in 2017. Uh, in oh, January. my goodness. I, uh, I went to the White House to see Mike Pence, who's a buddy of mine. And uh, uh, the fine man who got put in a bad spot. Um, he... he uh, he, he, I, I went, I went in there. I hadn't been in the White House for eight years. Wonder why. And, uh, so it's the first week and I walk in there and a bunch of Hillsdale kids are working there. Uh, there are hundreds who live in, in Washington, DC and work in the government. And they saw my name on the Rota and they came out and we had a chat in the reception room in the West Wing. And, uh, uh, and we're just talking, you know, it's fun. Oh, wow, look at you. What are you doing here? Uh, you know, and he is staring at us. And I said, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, yeah. And I said, you are Elon Musk. And he said, well, I'm not. And I said, matter of fact, you are. And he comes over and says, and who are you? And I said, well, I am the president of the greatest college on earth. And these are my kids. And he said, they don't look like kids to me. And I said to you, sir, they are authorities. They are kids to me. <laughs> I've never heard that story. Oh, I just so, I love that story. So anyway, he said, "Come uh, see me." So I go out there, and what was it like? I mean, uh, there were sleeping bags in the conference room, in the you know, in the factory on the executive floor, which is not it's part of a factory, right? The factory is very fancy and cool. You see pictures of it, but. Uh, they're sleeping bags. And I stared at them and he said, yep. He said, we're in manufacturing hell right now. And I said, uh, model three. He said, yeah, make or break. And I said, uh, well, I hope you make it. And he said, well, it's been hard because we had to figure out how to make a car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to pause here. One of the most inspiring moments of the last many years is the chopsticks moment when Musk grabs the rocket. 
you and I had never seen that before, and we are older men, and we grew up in the space age, and we had never seen anything like that before. And for Elon Musk to be for you, and by the way, he stood with me during my recent controversy, which was nice. And I don't know the man. I've only been in the room with him once listening to him talk, and I'm, I, I don't, I'm not an engineer. But I, I think you're igniting in me the sort of optimism I'm prone to. He excites me, and I hope they tap into that and harness that because America can boom. It can just absolutely boom again if we unleash it. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, and see, he, you know, he, he. Uh, I'll tell two more Musk stories that are my favorites. I ask him about this one. Uh, he, you know, he went in. He, he founded the Boring Company, right? And that's a play on words and very like him to think of that name. And uh, and why did he do it? He was at SpaceX, which is where you know close to the airport in L.A. where the freeways come together. And he sees that the freeways are all around him, looking at him, and they're all crowded. And he said, you know, we went up for offices. We should have gone down. And so he goes in and he orders the three largest German tunneling, boring machines. And by the time they arrived, he hired himself a bunch of engineers to make them faster. And because uh, you gotta, you know, gotta go fast. And uh, and so they arrive on big trucks, and he gets one of them off the truck, gets it set up, and says, "Let's fire this baby up." And they just go, <laughs> you know, right in the in the uh, uh, grounds of te- of uh, SpaceX. And I just think that's just perfect. You know, that's uh, uh, in California what? could be a little bit dangerous, but that's up to him to deal with it, you know, under nuisance law. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you do, I, I, I'm uh, not going to give any testimony against him, uh, but no, I don't think he got a permit. And, uh, you know, so, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and then, you know, he takes over Twitter and he, and he, he fires, I think he fired more than half the staff. And or they left. Or they left. They just didn't want to work for him. I think he let them go. And uh, Or he did let is, a lot go, but some some of them did the uh did did what I did and just said, I don't want to work for you. But he has proven it was really top heavy and because it's fine and it's boy, they hate him now. He has made himself an enemy of the administrative state. And the administrative state, including the California Coastal Commission, wants to punish him. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Government ought not to have an emotion of revenge, it, there's unless this thing it's in, the. I, there's this thing in Europe going on that the, what the, rulers of all things have a digital division, and they have threatened him, about an interview he did with Donald Trump, candidate for president, on Twitter, and the the threat is that they can fine him up to five percent of his global revenues, I read yesterday, of all his companies. So in other words, they're controlling the media. And I want to, I said last time that the fundamental question is, what is the title to rule? That's always, by the way, the fundamental question in politics. It's always that. Uh, If you're a political scientist, you learn to ask two questions. Every time you look at any nation, you figure out how it works. The first is, who rules? And the second is, how do they get to do it? In the name of what principle do they get to do it? Huh. And so in ours, uh, equal souls, consent of the governed, equipped by nature to guide our lives and organize our government. That's the original idea. Very beautifully put in the Declaration of Independence. The new idea is uh, human, humanity is capable of making progress through science. And so the scientist and scientific methods and those who apply them have a claim to sovereignty, that is to say, the legitimate title to rule. So when they call Donald Trump a dictator, uh, often they mean, and if you just read carefully, they, they they say this frequently, often they mean he doesn't follow the administrative process. He thinks he's the president elected by the sovereign people. That's the yeah. argument, see. And, and, and that argument has been going on in America for 150 years, something like that. 
and uh, you know, and, and it, it, I've said before, uh, I think on the show, but I'll say it now. Uh, this progressive idea of government got institutionalized in the popular branches of government with the election of Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. And so it's very instructive to compare the shape, just the big form of the government in 1930, a census year before he came in, with today. And in 1930, the government was 12% of the gross domestic product. Now it's 51% in 1930. And that's a, and remember, that's an adjustment between private and public activity. And in a liberal society, that that is critical, right? Liberal society means you're free. You can do what you want to. You know, take care of yourself, be good to your neighbors, bear your Obey own the cause. Law. Yeah. Obey the law. Uh, but but we, so that that we've taken what is it twelve? It's uh, we've taken thirty eight percent of the economy, the biggest economy in the world, and we've moved it into the public sector. And then we did a second thing uh, in nineteen thirty. Uh, more than sixty percent of the money raised and spent in government was raised and spent in cities and counties and towns. Now that number is under twenty percent. Uh, the federal government, if I remember the number right was 23% in 1930, and now it's 63%. So we've moved the money inside the government farther away from the people and their direct needs. And so that's a revolution, right? And that is entrenched in, you know, with a whole class of people who work in that. And it affects uh, the academy because the doctrines that justify that movement, that is, there has to be some principle behind it. Why is this a good thing to do, right? And and uh, that was born in the academy, and it tends to make uh, college professors and colleges into rulers instead of monks. I'd like to say a, a really great college professor has something akin to a monk because he's gotten deep inside something and he pursues it his whole life and all he does is talk about it. And it's something eternal, you know, and that's, so not that anymore, right? Uh, and it affects business because your government, by definition, now it's, you know, half the economy passes through the hands of the government one way or another. Uh, in business, uh, the economy, uh, the government is in principle your biggest customer and your biggest customer has regulatory power over you. And that means it affects industry too. And then here's, and, and I, I want to just make the thing sharp. I, I've tried to repeat accurately the claim of a good that leads to this movement, which is we can make untold progress if we place everything in the hands of scientific methods. That's the argument. Here's the counter. Yes. It's in James Madison, and that is government is the profoundest of all commentaries on human nature. If men were angels, no government would be needed. If angels were to govern men, neither internal nor external controls on the government would be necessary. And the thing is, what I believe, my argument, uh, many, me and many people, um, is that they thought that the scientifically trained people in the government who have tenured and guaranteed salaries would not have any personal interest in serving anything except the public good. That, 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 that's what they write that. There's a guy named Landis who writes that uh, because they won't have any interest, they will only act justly. Well, oh my goodness. You know, and, and what? Uh, if you look up the top 10, I haven't done it lately, but if you look up the top 10 contributors in politics, uh, public employee unions are very high. They're in politics. So, okay, stop it right there. We'll come back and finish my conversation with Dr. Arn from Friday in the next hour. All things Hilltail, by the way, are at hilltail.edu. This is not a sponsored segment, but if you want to know about Hillsdale, go to hilltail.edu. If you want to hear all my conversations with Dr. Arn, 800 of them. Q4Hillsdale.com. From the Book of Job and Plato to the present day, it's all at Q4Hillsdale.com. Joined by Bethany Mandel. She can be followed at Bethany Shondark on X. 
And she voted for Donald Trump. And I read that on t- election morning last week, Bethany. I thought maybe we got a good shot here because I had fallen prey to the narrative. I was really nervy last week. How about you? I was also. I The only thing that was stopping me for voting for President Trump was I've never actually voted for a winner in the history of my voting in presidential elections. And I was starting to feel like I was a jinx. But thank God we broke the streak. We're good. You're young. I started out with uh, Ford uh, losing to Carter. And so I had to wait uh, six years from the time I turned 18 to vote for Ronald Reagan. So it was well worth the wait. Bethany, the American Jewish vote, I do not know what the cross tab yet. What do you think it was? And did it move decisively in Philadelphia suburbs, Pittsburgh suburbs, and um, the suburbs of Detroit, where narrow margins delivered those states for Donald Trump? Yeah, absolutely. So I was talking to Jeff Bartos yesterday. He's the he's was an advisor for President Trump at the Jewish community and for Dave McCormick also in Pennsylvania. And he told me that there was there was a shift. And, and I believe it. If, if you look at I mean, it's I don't believe exit polls. So I, I've been seeing these polls. I don't believe them. But if you look at the election results in far in, in religious communities like Passaic, New Jersey, that swung 14 or 15 points for President Trump. Um, if you look at a map of New York City and you see these crazy dark red pockets in Williamsburg and Crown Heights, those are the Jews. So, I mean, there was a really significant shift in Ocean County, New Jersey, also the home of Lakewood, New Jersey, where my husband is from. Um, there were really, really significant shifts among sizable Jewish communities that are observant, um, 70, 80, 90 percent for Trump. Um, I think that we're seeing a real change among the Jewish electorate, at least on the religious side. And I that's the same in the Catholic community. When you care more about your faith, you vote differently. Well, I made the argument uh, the Republican Party is a secular organization, but people of deep religious faith concerned about their free exercise rights are flocking there. But I'm also I'm waiting for the attorney general because I want the attorney general to name an assistant attorney general for civil rights division and the office of civil rights at the Department of Education to go after these colleges and these communities where Jews are being attacked. I mean, go after hammer and tong. It is unacceptable in America. We don't want an Amsterdam to happen in America. Yeah, absolutely. I was saying that on Fox News last night. We need one of the like the strongest Jewish voices to be in charge of those departments for that reason. We need a Jewish voice who are protecting Jewish students because on these campuses, the students who are at most risk are the Jewish students. I think it was like four days ago at DePaul University, two students were violently assaulted. One of them had a concussion. The other had a broken wrist just because they held a sign that said, ask me anything. I'm a former IDF officer. And for that, they were violently assaulted. And this is where our audience may not know that the Division of Civil Rights at the Department of Justice can go and bring law enforcement with them to those campuses, to those communities. They can arrest people. They can prosecute them under the civil rights laws of the United States. And the campuses that do not protect Jewish students can have their aid suspended, their endowments taxed. I mean, there's a lot that can be done that this administration has not done, but I think the Trump administration will do. How confident are you, Bethany Mandel? I could not be more confident. I mean, remember, you know, go back in the Wayback Machine and think about how Donald Trump added Judaism and anti-Semitism to, I think it's Title VI or Title IX. I don't know. I haven't slept enough to remember. But at the time, he was mocked and said, Jewish students are fine. He's just singling out Jewish students. I mean, he was criticized even by Jews because he made Jews a protected class. And it you know, it turned out to be absolutely brilliant. And he was proven correct during this administration who refused to do anything. And now fast forward, we have Elise Stefanik, who was, you know, the greatest defender of Jewish students on campus besides Virginia Fox. I'm praying that Virginia Fox is in a top position at the Department of Education. Tiffany Justice, the the head of Moms for Liberty, is also so strong on this issue. I hope that she's the Secretary of Education. Now, this morning, the barbarians in Hezbollah hit a kindergarten, direct hit, with a missile. The kids got the warning and they were in the shelter. There are no deaths. But they shot at a kindergarten, Bethany. I don't think this war is going to be over by the inauguration. Do you? The the only way I see this war being over is if they're they're sort of fearing a Reagan moment and they decide to preemptively end the war. I, I am praying that President Trump keeps 
this war at the top of his agenda, the hostages at the top of his agenda. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that he sits down and meets with these hostages as soon as possible, the families as soon as possible, and, and signal to Hamas that like, this is it. The game is over. The second I become president, your n days are numbered. And if you want a chance at survival, you know, end this now. Yeah. Withdraw, but withdraw north of the Lithani, turn over your rockets and uh, try and win an election. Iran, we're coming for you long range if we need to. The B-52s are there. And I don't know that he'll say that. Donald Trump is talks loudly and carries a big stick. But he doesn't really threaten war very often, Bethany. And I don't know that he wants to threaten war. I just think he needs to send messages. Last word to you. No, and I don't think he needs to. But I think that, you know, the hostages, especially the seven Americans who are still being held, that that is where he needs to carry the biggest stick. There are seven Americans being held hostage in the tunnels of Gaza. They already executed one of them and their time is running out. Hey, amen, Bethany. Well said. Follow Bethany on X at Bethany Shondark. You can listen to the other half of Bethany on the commentary podcast where Seth Mandel is most days. Thank you, Bethany Mandel. Someday Democrats are going to learn. You can't beat Ted Cruz in Texas and you cannot beat Rick Scott in Florida. He joins me now. Rick Scott, congratulations on your reelection and handy reelection. They poured a lot of money into trying to beat you. What was the final margin, Senator? 1.4 million votes. <laughs> we won Miami-Dade by 10 points. We won Osceola, which is the Puerto Rican uh, majority uh, county. We won the county that, that Tampa's in. We won the county that St. Pete's in. We won the county that uh, that uh, Jacksonville's in. Of course, we won Miami big. So 5.9 million votes. I, you know, we are this, Florida is the center of the Republican Party of America. And look, everybody from Florida is getting appointed. You know, Senator, I want to point out that you ran for governor twice. They tried to knock you off. This is your second run for senator. I don't know how much money's been spent against you, but do you think they'll give up now? I I I think they should give up on Florida. I bet they've spent three hundred million dollars against me. Yeah, uh, it's it's crazy. It's like you and Cruz. You bankrupted yeah. the Democratic Party. So, Senator, let's talk about tomorrow. I've had John Thune on. If John Cornyn called, all three of you guys are great friends of mine and of the program. Why are you running for leader? Well, I'm I'm running because I think we have to have, you know, dramatic change. We've got to get the Trump agenda accomplished. I'm a business guy. I know how to get things done. Um, I've talked to my colleagues. Uh, they know they we you know, we have to have big change. They they want to get treated as equals. They want us to have an agenda. They want to be part of a team. They know I've got a great working relationship with Donald Trump and with Speaker of the House Mike Johnson. And I'm a business guy. Business guy. What do you do? You have a purpose. You build a team. You write a plan. You measure living daylights out of things, and guess what? Ah, you have success. So I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to have success. We've got to get this stuff done. You know, the business uh, plan really thing. Can I, can I pause on that? Because I've been trying to explain the budget and reconciliation process to people. Would you explain it to them? We, we get 100 days, and we get one budget reconciliation this year, and it's got to be big. What would you imagine for it? Uh, well, first off, you've got, to, you've got to revamp it. You've got to get, you know, reduce taxes. I mean, our taxes are too big. And you've got to change the size of government. We're spending 40% more than we take in. Our, our taxes are too high. I cut taxes, by the way, every year as governor, I cut taxes and fees 100 times. Guess what? My revenues went up. The economy got better. So what we've got to think about is how do we get people back to work? How do we, how do we reduce the cost of living for people? I mean, I can just say you, people are struggling I mean, I, I stopped at a restaurant the other day to grab a sandwich, and the young lady says, look, Governor, I moved. She, she says, I, I moved when you were governor, and I could afford it. I, she says, I can't afford to live here anymore. Everything's gotten too expensive. You've got to fix this. That's going to take dramatic change. And so what we've got to do is we've got to pass a budget, and we've got to get – we have to stop and say to ourselves, why do we do – like, why do we have the Department of Education? Why, do, why is the federal government involved in so many agencies, and so many things? Why do we, if, if they want to run everything, why do we have our state? I believe in state rights. I believe people ought to, our governors and their legislatures ought to be responsible for education and so many things that the federal government has gotten involved in. And what they've done is all they do is bog everything down. You can't get a permit. You, you've got to, you've got, they're telling you how to run your life. This is easy. That's why we have our state. That's how this was set up. So it's a United States 
of America. It's not the federal government of America. Senator, I believe that the spending clause would support conditioning federal education dollars on every state that receives them, that wants them, Im implementing a school choice program at least as robust as Florida and Arizona's and West Virginia's and Ohio. I mean, we, there's a standard. We can't mandate the end of public schools, but right. certainly, do you think reconciliation could support that kind of a requirement on education absolutely. spending? Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, what uh, we've got to do is we've got to say, what can we do? And don't be shy. I mean, let's do shy. everything we can do. We have, there are so many things we have to do. We have to have a we have to have a military that can scare the crap out of our enemies. We've got to we've got to balance our budget. We can balance the budget. Guess what? I balanced budget when I was governor. Florida had not balanced its budget in 20 years before I became governor. I balanced the budget when I was in business. How do you do it? You say, it's what my revenues are going to be. I'm not spending more than that. It's not that hard. But you have to create a process for everything you want to get done. So we know we, know we have to get a budget done. We know we have to do reconciliation. Let's, let's go to the where, – when do we have to have these things done? Let's move backwards. Who's going to be responsible? What's our timeline? What's our measurement? And then do it. We've got to get the Trump agenda accomplished. We've got to get his judges in. We've got to get his nominees done. We've got to, we've got to, this is not for the faint of heart. This is for somebody that wants to bust their butt every day to get this done. Now, Senator Cornyn put out, and you retweeted, and I'm sure Senator Thune agrees, around the clock, 24-7, 365, to get Donald Trump as nominees because we cannot have a replay of 2017. Uh, can you explain that to people? Well, here, here's our schedule. I was shocked when it came up here. But here's, the, here's the schedule since I've been up here for six years, okay? It, we have a vote at 530. We don't know what we're voting on, by the way, until uh, generally uh, Monday morning. We don't know what we're voting on, but at 530, you know, we're going to have a vote at, at night. And then we leave here at 145 on Thursday. Now, the, the Senate is a process. It's, it, ta it takes so many days to do each thing we do. So the only way we're going to get this done is if we commit to be here. That means I think for the first whatever time it takes, if it's the first 100 days, if it's the first 200 days, we should be here every day. We should be here every day and, and, and get everything done. If the Democrats want to slow everything down, which that's what they've done, that's what they did with Trump the first time, if they want to slow it down, then they're going to have to be here every day to do it. Because we're – my belief is let's stay here until we get his nominees done, until we get reconciliation done. Let's get all this done now. We know we know this country has to be saved. Donald Trump is he ran on a campaign to do these things. We gotta have we gotta have a leader and a Republican Party up here that does it. Now Senator, I want to get deep in the in the weeds with a potential majority leader. The blue slip process is the blue slip process, it's never gonna change. But I do believe California hadn't had a good district court judge nominated during a Republican presidency for as long as I can remember. I do believe in nominating a bunch of people and appointing them for one year, and then they can retire. You can find retired partners. You can find retired judges to put up there, nominate, go into recess, and, and recess appoint them for a year. Is that legit in your view? Well, what, what Donald Trump has asked is would, would people support a recess appointments for non judicial? Actually, I actually believe that we can get judicial nominees done. Because um, here's, the, here's the deal. The blue slip process works as long as people are respective of it. If you, if you just say, oh, I'm not even going to talk to you. Like well, I, that's I, the California you know, senators. They wouldn't even talk to the, to the leader and the Republicans when uh, the, Donald Trump. Then what you have to say is the blue slip, the blue slip process doesn't work. Because that's, what this is is the only way it's, it works is if, if, you know, when you're, there's a Democrat president, Republicans work to try, try to find a good judge. When the when the Democrats there are a Republican president, Democrats have to work. If they don't, the booster process doesn't work. You you can't have a process that just is used to completely stop the appointment of judges. The president has a right to appoint judges. Well said, or or to nominate them and they get a vote. Let me conclude by this and. Uh... Senator Thune spoke to the, no matter who wins, do you think the 53 will come together? I hope so. Um, but we've got, when, when I say come together, though, we've got to come together on the Trump agenda. We've got to come together on getting nominees done. We, you know, this, this idea that we're going to work, you know, two and a half days a week, 
is crazy. This idea that we're going to be, you know, we're not going to bust our butt every day for the Trump agenda. If that's it, it depends. If it all comes down to, and I think hopefully whoever wins will understand we have got to have big change. I'm running, and I, as you know, I ran two years ago because this has got to change. I'm tired. No, I, I mean, I got to get a quick question in. If Marco Rubio becomes Secretary of State, that would be a great appointment. Who becomes the next senator? Who would you recommend to Ron DeSantis? Oh gosh, uh, there's a there's a there's a lot of good people um, that we've got. Mike Waltz is going to the White House, so he can't be on the list. Yeah, I know Mike Waltz would be Mike, Mike Waltz would be great. Um, I mean, there's there's great Vern Buchanan, um, Byron Byron Donald, oh, yeah. Jack Hammock. I mean, there's we got so many Corey Mills. Um, we have Florida is Donald like the ground zero of the Republican talent pool, isn't it? Yeah, we've got great Mario Diaz Ballard, um, Carlos Jimenez, Mario Salazar. I mean, we have got so we have got so much talent. Uh, it's it's unbelievable. Senator Rick Scott, great to talk to you. I appreciate your taking time. Again, I just want to say congratulations. I, you're right. I Thank think you. they've spent three hundred million dollars against you, and it bounces off. pebbles against a battleship. Thank you, Senator Scott. All right, bye bye. General Lissimo will be typing the transcript of my interview with Senator Scott. It'll be posted on my YouTube channel, along with my earlier conversation with Congressman, former Congressman Mike Gallagher, and my opening monologue. I hope you will like and subscribe my YouTube channel. We do not overwhelm you with anything, but we do send you, if you subscribe, two to four videos a day from the best interviews and always the monologue. I also hope that you understand you're a sophisticated audience. Senator Cornyn, Senator Scott, and Senator Thune are my friends, and they're great conservatives, all of them. I, do, I don't have an opinion on who ought to win because I'm not a dummy. Dummies have opinions on who ought to win that race because I know the electorate is 53 people, right? 53 people, and it's a secret ballot. Nobody impacts, and, and there are, by the way, dominoes that fall in ways you only, I only, I don't even bother trying to figure it out. I have the vaguest idea that if X gets Y, then Z steps up to A and, and D goes over to J. It's a complicated place with an incentive structure that is simply and rightfully arcane because the United States Senate is an arcane place that protects our republic by being an arcane place. I was talking about the blue slip rule with Senator Scott. The blue slip rule is district court judges only proceed to a vote if at least one of the senators from the state in which they will serve returns a, quote, blue slip, a green light. So, and senators are never given up that power. And the trouble is that places like California, which are deep blue, have not had a district court judge confirmed because first Kamala Harris and now the two people who are there, uh, Adam Schiff has not yet been there, so he's not responsible. Maybe Adam Schiff will actually play ball. You get one, I get two. That's how it works. Usually the president gets two and the, the senator, the two Democratic senators get one. But in some places, the Democratic senators don't play ball. Or, and so it, it's just got to end. It's got to end because California's got backlogs that are crazy. Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, was my guest on Friday. But we went long. We talked for another full hour. And here's the conclusion of that conversation. All things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. But this is not a Hillsdale dialogue, not sponsored by Hillsdale. I just want to give it to you for free. But, but I want to finish by talking with you. I, I've always said the Constitution matters because it protects our ability to speak, and it protects our ability to pray and to believe. And I believe the Christian gospel is true, and I want people to know it and hear it, and I do not want to be interfered in my ability to tell people about it. And I think that the administrative state is hostile to religious belief by virtue of what it is and the claims that religious belief makes. And religious belief is cabined uh, because of the Establishment Clause, but it is vibrant because of the Free Exercise Clause. I think that we are, we saw the Catholics dramatically shift to Donald Trump. It's the one crosstab I have studied 
it's enormous. Now, Joe Biden is a Catholic, and so he appealed to Catholics to vote for him in 2020. Uh, whatever their doctrinal differences on on things like abortion, and it was not without effect. But there was no appeal made on faith by the vice president. I don't know what her faith system is. I just believe that faith matters so much to the Constitution that it's there to protect it. And I know what James Madison thought about religious liberty. Do you think, and this is a hard question, do you think our country is becoming so secular that religious belief is going to be endangered in the next 25 years? Yeah, it is endangered. Uh, but that's what the argument is about. And uh, you see, remember, you know, this, uh, you know, human beings, uh, Churchill liked to say about people, unteachable from infancy to tomb. We got charmed <laughs> into some arguments that looked really great. And now we have experience with them, right? Turns out these people are people, and it would be better if they would obey. And the only change you have to make is that the bureaucracy, which should be trimmed in the way that uh, Elon Musk has gone about trimming, it should be trimmed because it's very expensive and it interferes with the operation of our lives. But the most important thing is that it understand that it must obey the will of the people expressed in their elected representatives. You see, that's the thing. Uh, uh, Donald Trump was elected president of the United States in 2016. Uh, the Constitution gives him authority from us, which is the authority under its lights. And therefore, he gets to appoint the attorney general. And the head of the FBI uh, is, is selected and responsible to his appointed official, and that means indirectly to the president. James Comey did not think he was working for Donald Trump. You see? I agree. And, the, and, that, and that's, that's the point. That's the issue. If we can get that right, and, and what I, the, reason, the, main, the main reason I rejoice about this election is we're going to have an argument about that now. And I think that there will be articulate arguments made on both sides. And that sets up for the people to figure it out. And uh, it's going to be. I want to close with. Uh, it's going to be intense and it's going to be ongoing. And we're going to do it again and again, both by direct conversation and indirectly by discussing the Republic, for example, on Friday. I want to ask you, though, um, a lot of colleges and universities set up therapy rooms, basically. They were worried about the fragility of their students as the election approached. I wonder what was the campus like on election night in Hillsdale? Uh, because I doubt very much you prepared one way or the other because you trust your students. But what was the atmosphere like at Hillsdale where I think if anyone is listening, send your kids to Hillsdale, please. If, if they can get in, it's pretty hard to get into now. But what was it like? Uh, it's just the same. Uh, there's a poll in the college paper that shows that most of our students were Trump supporters. And, uh, I think Trump got a plurality of the grown-ups. Uh, but uh, uh, it wasn't a divisive thing, right? Because uh, there are two, you know, I don't like rules, but there are two practices. One is there's no whining at Hillsdale College. Uh, so no crying in baseball, no whining at Hillsdale. That's right. I love to say that there's no whining at Hillsdale College, and uh, and they, you know, they buck up when you say that to them mostly. And if somebody's in trouble, we got counselors and stuff. But uh, yeah. if it was a whole lot of people, we couldn't manage it. Uh, they do. Uh, there is a group, by the way, that brings puppies onto campus from the Humane Society during finals. Because finals are very stressful here, of which we're proud. And I don't mind. Well, they ought to be, that. They we ought get, to be we stressful. Get to we get back to work. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's, you know, I, I did not think about that. I, it, it, uh, in last spring, when the, uh, you know, many elite colleges became unable to function. Remember, they couldn't have class. Yeah. And, uh, 
I was gone all that week when it peaked. When it hit big, it peaked a little later, actually. And I thought, and I come back on Friday, and I said, I wonder if anybody's talking about that. And uh, I hadn't sent anybody a note about anything. I hadn't told the security guys to pay attention. Uh, and I come back, and I go in the dining hall, and I lunchtime, and I look across, and I listen for a minute, and I say, yep, this is still Hillsdale College. And then I had to, uh, at, at lunch, I sat down with a bunch, and we have a conversation. And I had to bring that up. You know, anybody think about that around here? And they, it wasn't on their minds. And they sort of looked up for a minute and said, yeah, we noticed that. You know, <laughs> so it's not, that's just stupid, isn't it? Uh, and it's, it's so healthy. It's such a healthy environment. It's, it's the life of the mind as it's supposed to be done. And it's why Hillsdale is thriving and why Dr. Arn gets my grudging admiration for all of his work over these 30 years. Uh, but I, I appreciate very much the extra time on Friday because uh, we couldn't cover everything. And so we're putting on Tuesday. I want to remind everyone, everything at Hillsdale is at hillsdale.edu. Any new courses coming, Dr. Arn, soon to the video? Three or four. And uh, what are they? Uh, I don't know if we've released one on the totalitarian novels, but that's either just released or soon released. Uh, we're doing one on uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, I think. Uh, Very good. Well, I hope uh, that as a it, the Trump uh, they're, transition they're, they're, team settles in, yeah, as they select uh, people, I want them to go I, read the con uh, to take the Constitution course. If you're going to work for I Donald did, Trump, uh, take the Constitution I did, course. I did talk to somebody from the transition team. Uh, about education generally a month ago. And uh, I got the impression that they're very orderly and they're thinking hard and a lot of people working on it. And then they wanted to know what I think about education. And I thought, I think the most important thing is to decentralize control of it. And uh, uh, because the learning is in the student and, this, and the teachers and the parents help and so authority and resources in education should be as close to that process as possible. And right now, more than half the employees in public education are not teachers. And that looks to me like a misarrangement. Uh, I hope they wrote the that down. Yeah. Uh, well, they, because they, the spending they, power, they yeah, the spending power can make a lot of changes directly that are simply to retreat from the operation of the education system to leave off with the bureaucrats micromanaging, never to do COVID again. But they can also tell states, if you want our money, you have to have a school choice option or support homeschooling. Because honestly, we, we've just got to get out of the business of demanding obedience from states. The federal government has no right to do that, but they have a right to condition their money. Uh, I hope that they do it wisely. Uh, final, a quick question, because we're, we're now out of time on the second hour. The, um, the Title IX controversy, I believe, was a sleeper issue, the girls and yeah. boys and girls sports. Do you think it was? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people are alarmed about that. Uh, uh, the rebellion against that broke into the national news in Loudoun County, Virginia, outside D.C., a blue place. And uh, yes. Parents were very upset because uh, they're changing the lives of their children without permission from the parents. And uh, the children are minors. Who owns the children? See, that sovereignty issue, I was talking about that, raises the question, who owns the children? Under the own, old doctrine of natural rights, the children own the children and the parents act for them while they are minors the people who love them the most and brought them into the world. In the new idea, children become something like factors of production. And the Republican Party has passed laws in education that imply that, as the Democratic Party has as well. So, yeah, that's, and you know, the people don't, you know, we need more kids in America. Uh, everybody listen to the show. I don't know how many kids you got, but have some more. And uh, Amen. And, 
we need parents to be responsible for them. And uh, then they can grow up strong and good and be humans. So it's a sacrifice, that, but it is one well worth doing. And oh, yeah. on that note, um, part two of the election edition of the Hillsdale Dialogue, nonpartisan throughout, is complete. Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, thank you, all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. All of our conversations, including part one, can be found at Hugh for Hillsdale.com. Now, I also want to tell you that because so many people wanted to hear everything that Dr. Arn said, we did a rare thing. We packaged it all and put it on my YouTube channel. It will appear in the Hillsdale Dialogue series as usual, as one dialogue, but all of it is over at my YouTube video. You just go Hugh Hewitt, YouTube, subscribe, and uh, about 72,000 subscribers are the smartest people in America. And if you want to be a smart person to go there, not because I'm smart, but because I talk to people like Dr. Arn and Senator Scott and Senator Cornyn and Senator Thune, and I'm very, very, very interested in facts. And if I'm wrong, I'll tell you. That's rare in media. And I'm going to continue to hold that line. Uh, facts are stubborn things, and you get them right here. Chuck Schumer finally figured it out. Invited Dave McCormick, Senator-elect from Pennsylvania, to the orientation. Good for him. Dave McCormick is going to be a great senator for America. Uh, the 53, and I don't know who's going to replace J.D. Vance, and I don't know who's going to replace Marco Rubio or any other senator who's selected. I know that uh, yelling at Mike DeWine and Ron DeSantis online doesn't make a lick of difference. Both, whoever is nominated in both of those states, I think, I'm certain in Ohio, they have to run in 2026 and they have to run again in 2028. They better be very strong candidates. Uh, in Florida, less so. But Ohio, Sherrod Brown could rise up out of his political grave and come roaring back in an off year. 2026 is going to be a difficult cycle for the Republicans, unless the Republicans get the things done that Donald Trump promised. Build the border wall. Build the border wall. Build the border wall. Uh, extend the Trump tax cuts. Make them permanent. Revise them a little bit. Raise the SALT deduction, which is capped at $10,000 right now. Maybe double it. Uh, eliminate taxes on tips. Uh, the defense buildup's got to begin. School choice has got to be mandated. I, I want NPR wiped out. Not wiped out. I, want their I don't want there to be a federal subsidy for my competitors. I'm sorry, I just don't. I've been doing this for 25 years without a nickel of federal spending. They don't need federal spending. Neither the Corporation for Public Broadcast. These are small things, but they are symbolic of resolve to cut back the administrative state. The my last job in the government was the acting director of the Office of Personnel Management. I know the Civil Service Reform Act backwards and forwards. It was passed in 1978. It's a nightmare. And it's time to give firing authority to the heads of cabinet departments and executive branch agencies so that they can fire up to 5% of their people every year without cause, just for reduction in force standing authority. Get rid of people, especially partisan hacks who have burrowed in, especially them. I, um, I also want to call your attention. Lame duck sessions are dangerous things. Now, I expect Chuck Schumer to spend all of his time moving judicial nominees to the floor and to a vote. Takes a lot of time, takes a lot of legislative time, probably going to need a CR as well. I do not want them to pass the big pharma bailout. Now, I, I have a sponsor, Conservatives for Lower Health Care Costs, and this is not, they didn't pay for this. But they're not paying for me what I'm about to tell you. You can find out about them at pharmawindfall.com. Pharmawindfall.com. Not everything that comes out of a lame duck is bad. I support the, the bill that will save AM broadcasting and thus our emergency broadcast system in which we have invested billions of dollars in which we really need really, really need to work on the AM band. And so I think AM radios ought to be in every car in America because what do you turn to when the weather gets bad or when you're any kind of emergency, fire, earthquake, hurricane? AM radio. I'm on FM radio. I'm online. You're watching me on the Salem News Channel. My life doesn't depend upon it. A lot of you listen to my podcast, Highly Concentrated Hugh. And a lot of you listen to my YouTube channel. And a lot of you listen to Dwayne's World. There are lots of ways to communicate but America needs AM radio, and they need it in cars for a lot of different reasons. 
And I, I don't mind if that passes in the lame duck. It's bipartisan. It's got like 400 sponsors in the House. But I do not want a windfall for big pharma. I do not want a windfall for big pharma. And Speaker Johnson should just fold his arms and say, no, we are not delinking anything. We are not sending for, I think the number is $32 billion to big pharma. Now, big pharma does a lot of wonderful things. I like new drugs. I like that they're saving lives. I think the, the mRNA vaccines are amazing. My, my older brother, Mycroft Hewitt, is the scientist in the family. Both of my older brothers are Mycroft Hewitt. I'm the dummy. But Mycroft is the PhD toxicologist who's retired. And he, he sits and he reads all sorts of great stuff. And then he decodes for me what they're writing about in the scientific journals. And one of the things they're writing about is that mRNA is a great thing. Well, that's wonderful. Let the scientists do science. Let big pharma make their money the old-fashioned way by developing drugs and getting them to market for demand that is high. Or when the President of the United States, as Donald Trump did with Operation Warp Speed, says we need a vaccine, let them go to work. I love them when they're doing science. I do not love them doing politics. They screwed up Obamacare. They sold us for 30 pieces of silver in Obamacare. And the, the country's health care system is a nightmare now. Uh, and it's going to stay a nightmare for a long time. Pathway evolution got jagged. But I do know PharmaWindfall.com will give you the details on delinking. And you don't want it to pass. And I should have told Rick Scott about it. But I, I just wanted, if John Cornyn calls me up and wants to be on tomorrow, we'll put him on. We've got John Thune, Rick Scott, and John Cornyn's been on here enough to be related to me. And, and the deal is, they're all three great conservatives. They are all three great conservatives. You have no idea what the 53 senators are going to do. I have no idea. I don't try and predict. I don't ask any of my senator buddies who they're voting for because it's none of my business. The, the Senate caucus is unto itself, and Senate terms are six years. Uh, Two-thirds of them are going to be there after, and probably more, after Donald Trump retires in 2029. So the Senate is its own deal. Read the Constitution, Article 1. Not up to me to decide who runs the Republican Leadership Conference, or you. We'll just support whoever wins. Uh, the uh, Rick Scott transcript will be up over at hughhewitt.com soon.